It's May 3rd, 1958, and the arena in Boston, Massachusetts is packed with screaming young rock and roll fans. Alan Freed watches happily as Jerry Lee Lewis frantically pounds on his piano, bashing out his biggest hit, Great Balls of Fire. Out on the arena scuffed parquet floor, the kids are dancing in the aisles, some of them knocking over folding chairs as they try to push closer to the stage. It's chaos, which is exactly what Freed wants this show to be. Freed is a radio DJ by trade, one of the nation's most popular, thanks to his association with rock and roll, which is now all the rage. To build up his name and earn extra money, he often hosts rock concerts like this one. Usually, despite their frenzied energy, Freed's shows go off without a hitch. But here in Boston, that hasn't always been the case. Boston is a conservative, staunchly Catholic town that doesn't take kindly to Freed's music or his young, scruffy, racially mixed audiences. After Freed's last show here two years ago, Boston's mayor banned rock and roll shows entirely. But as soon as the ban was lifted, Freed couldn't wait to come back. He loves these Boston kids as much as he hates the city's blue blood authorities. They deserve to see Jerry Lee Lewis in action as much as anyone. Freed's marveling at Lewis's manic energy when one of his assistants rushes over with a concerned look. He yells into Freed's ear over the music, Get them back in their seats, or we're going to have trouble. Cops. Freed peers into the darkness at the back of the arena and sees them. Boston cops, in their blue uniforms and peaked caps, gathering in large numbers. Some already have their billy clubs out. He realizes he has to take control of the situation. Freed runs onto the stage and snatches the microphone stand next to Lewis's piano. Lewis and his band shamble to a halt. Freed flashes his best smile and tries to play it cool. All right, listen, hold it, hold it. I have to stop the show for a minute, kids. You all have to sit down. The show won't go on unless you get back in your seats. Reluctantly, the crowd complies, and the show resumes. But just minutes later, the kids are back in the aisles. This time, the police turn on the house lights. The boos get louder. Something lands on the stage with a dull thud. An empty wine bottle in a paper bag. Then a beer can, then another wine bottle. It takes several minutes, but Freed finally manages to quiet the crowd. Everyone returns to their seats again. Chuck Berry comes out to begin his headlining set. But something's wrong. The house lights are still on. Freed turns to tell the stage manager to dim them, but instead sees a Boston police sergeant, an older cop, with a ruddy face and a gray walrus mustache standing in the wings, blocking anyone from getting near the lighting controls. Come on, the kids are in the seats. Dim the lights. No, they stay on for the rest of the show. You can't do that. These kids pay good money for the show. The lights are ruining it. But the police sergeant won't budge, making Freed furious. He stomps back onto the stage and grabs the microphone again, interrupting Chuck Berry mid-lyric. Kids, they won't let me turn off the lights. I guess the Boston police don't want you to have a good time. Now, all hell breaks loose. Some kids on the floor stand in their seats, booing loudly. Other kids in the upper sections pick up their seats and toss them over the railing onto the floor ten feet below. More objects rain down on the stage. Bottles, cans, empty candy boxes. Chuck Berry takes refuge behind the drum set, but his band keeps playing through the craziness. As soon as the show ends, Freed hightails it out through a service entrance behind the stage. That one got a bit rough, but at least they were able to finish the show. He heads back to his hotel to get some much-needed sleep. He's got another show the next night in Montreal, Canada. To Freed, the disturbances at the Boston concert were no big deal. Rock and roll is supposed to get a little wild. He's seen worse than a few thrown chairs. But the media doesn't see it that way. Within days, national headlines are calling the Boston concert a rock and roll riot. After the show, on a nearby street, there was a stabbing. It's not clear whether assailant or victim were even at Freed's show, but it doesn't matter. In the New York Times, that becomes a rock and roll stabbing. Nearly every article about the so-called riot describes Freed as the instigator. But Freed's weathered negative press before. One of his earliest concerts in Cleveland in 1952 was also described as a riot. But this feels different. Anti-rock and roll sentiment is reaching a fever pitch. Parents are terrified of this strange new music with its sexually charged backbeat. Much of the terror is from white parents, afraid that their children are in thrall of rock's charismatic performers, many of whom are black. Freed's Boston concert, with its racially mixed performers and audience, has become a flashpoint for their fears. But Freed has more to contend with than just sensationalized news reports and frightened parents. Other shows he's scheduled to MC are being canceled left and right. And then, on May 8th, just five days after the Boston concert, a hastily convened grand jury indicts him for unlawful destruction of property. On May 9th, the next day, WINS Radio in New York fires him. Suddenly unemployed, under indictment, and losing much-needed income from his concerts, Freed hunkers down in his Connecticut mansion, wondering what to do next. He needs to get back on the air, and fast, that's his first priority. Without a regular DJ job, he can't keep collecting the number one source of income that's keeping him afloat, payola. Record companies won't pay him to play their songs if he's got nowhere to play them. But Freed's got bigger problems than that. The Boston riot had made him the perfect scapegoat for the rock and roll backlash. And when authorities begin looking into Alan Freed's activities, they're going to discover the perfect way to take him down.
American Scandal is sponsored by the new Audible original Bad Republican by Meghan McCain. In her debut audio memoir, Meghan McCain gives a first-hand look into the life of the conservative rebel and departing co-host of The View. You'll hear what it's like to grow up as the daughter of an American icon and to mourn his loss very publicly just one year into her tenure as co-host of America's most-watched daytime talk show. Her memoir also reveals how she handled attacks from the U.S. president and her thoughts on cancel culture, dating, and how our country treats new mothers. It's unsparingly honest, deeply relatable, and highly entertaining. Go beyond what you know about Meghan McCain from TV and your newsfeed. Visit audible.com slash bad Republican and listen now. We get support from the new podcast, Hemingway's Picasso. Stephen Coe lived many lives. He was an NFL journeyman, a male model, and one of the most well-connected smugglers in 1980s Miami. Coe collected many souvenirs from his adventures, but his most treasured bounty, a beautiful ceramic crafted by Pablo Picasso and gifted to Ernest Hemingway at the author's Cuban home. So the story goes. Lost during the Cuban Revolution, the artwork resurfaced when Coe took it as payment for a drug run financed by the notorious Pablo Escobar. Coe passed away in 2018, passing the piece down to his son, Stevie. Stevie feels he needs to complete his father's mission of selling this piece and telling Steve's cinematic life story. Is the Picasso authentic or a fraud? Was Steve Coe a big talker or a real deal smuggler? Listen to new episodes of Hemingway's Picasso every Monday, wherever you get your podcasts. From Wondery, I'm Lindsey Graham, and this is American Scandal. In the late 1950s, rock and roll is on the rise. It seems like every radio station in the country has abandoned their previous playlists of crooner hits and big band swing to play rock music every hour of the day. And rock's leading advocates, radio DJ Alan Freed and TV host Dick Clark, are becoming superstars as revered by teenagers as Marlon Brando and James Dean, but more accessible. The parents are worried. Rock music is rebellious, wild, rule-breaking, a bad influence on their kids, especially when the performers playing the wild music are black. And when the press starts reporting that some rock music is getting on the airwaves thanks to a system of bribes and behind-the-scenes deals called payola, Parents start demanding that the DJs playing this so-called music be held accountable. This is episode two, The Devil's Music. It's July of 1958. On a muggy afternoon in West Philadelphia, hundreds of teenagers line up along the sidewalk in the shadow of the Market Street elevated train. The lucky ones will be part of today's studio audience for American Bandstand, the most popular rock and roll television show in America. Inside WFIL-TV studios, American Bandstand's 28-year-old host Dick Clark strides confidently onto the set. He's in his element. Relaxed, confident, looking dapper as always, in a freshly pressed suit and perfectly styled hair. Since becoming the host of Bandstand two years ago, he's taken it from a locally produced show to a nationally syndicated hit. Every weekday afternoon, more than 8 million American teenagers tune in to watch him introduce the hottest new rock and roll acts and chat with the studio audience. He begins the show as he usually does with a word from the sponsors. American Bandstand, brought to you by Crystal Clear, sparkling 7-Up. Fresh, clean taste. Nothing does it like 7-Up, that's for sure. Clark acts as a sort of on-camera DJ, playing records, reading ad copy. The teen audience gets up and dances. And today is no different. Everything's humming along smoothly. But then Clark feels a tug on the back of his jacket. He turns around and sees an older guy holding out a 45 single. He yells to Clark over the loud music, I got a record here, you're gonna love it. Clark's annoyed, but not surprised. Ever since Bandstand became a national hit, the offices of WFIL-TV have been crawling with record promo men, flogging their latest singles. Clark yells back, trying to be polite. I'll catch you when we get off the air. Now, if you don't mind, please get back behind the cameras. But the promo man won't budge. I was hoping you could play it right now. There's a hundred bucks in it for you. Well, now Clark is pissed. Who does this guy think he is? Clark waves over the stage manager. Get this clown off my set. On camera, Dick Clark has carefully cultivated his image. Polite, clean cut, totally non-threatening. It's an image he feels he has to maintain for Bandstand to be a success. In middle America, white middle-class America, rock and roll is seen as threatening. People call it the devil's music. Half of them might never let their kids watch Bandstand if the host wasn't so well-mannered. But off camera, Dick Clark is not to be trifled with. He's a tough-minded businessman. Some even call him ruthless. He owns or has a stake in well over a dozen music-related companies, and they've made him a wealthy man. He doesn't need some sleazy promo guy's $100 bill tucked inside a record sleeve. When the promo man's gone, Clark steps out from behind his podium to introduce the day's first live act. Ladies and gentlemen, the fabulous Dwayne Eddy and the Rebel Rousers! As the bandstand kids dance to the twangy instrumental, Clark cracks a smile. He can tell this new Dwayne Eddy song is going to be a hit which is great news for Clark, who co-owns both Dwayne Eddy's record label and his management company. Dick Clark's various business ventures are all perfectly legal. His bosses at WFIL know he has a financial stake in many of the artists he brings on Bandstand, but they don't see it as a conflict of interest. In fact, Clark suspects they're probably happy he's making so much money on the side because it means they don't have to up his salary. Clark doesn't want to be just a DJ or even a successful TV host. He wants to build an empire, and he's convinced he can do it without getting his hands dirty. As far as Clark is concerned, none of his businesses have anything to do with payola. They're all squeaky clean. Dwayne Eddy finishes his performance and Clark goes to shake his hand. Thank you, Dwayne. That song's really something. As Eddie beams back at him, Clark makes a mental note to check and see who owns the publishing on this kid's new single. 
Maybe he can get a percentage of that, too. In September of 1958, at Alan Freed's Manhattan apartment, there's a knock on the door. It's Sam Weiss, owner of a record distribution company called Superior Record Sales. He's a slim, red-headed man, conservatively dressed. Except for his gold pinky ring, he could pass for a banker. For years, Sam and his brother High have been one of Freed's regular sources of payola, and these days, he needs all the payola he can get. Money seems to fly through his hands faster than he can collect it. He's twice divorced, paying alimony and child support to both ex-wives. Then there's his mansion in Connecticut, and what a boondoggle that was. He's still paying two mortgages on it, and he doesn't even live there anymore. His ex-wife kept it in the divorce. Freed and Weiss sit down at the dining room table, where Weiss reaches into his expensive black suit jacket and takes out a leather-bound checkbook and a gold pen. He makes out a check for $700, payable to cash, and hands it to Freed. Weiss and Freed have known each other for years, so Weiss tries to linger and chat, asking the DJ what new records he's into, but Freed is in no mood for small talk. You can let yourself out, he says. Weiss takes the hint and goes. Freed pours himself a drink and waits until he hears the elevator door in the hall open and close before he puts on his hat and coat. Then he takes the stairs two at a time down to the lobby where he practically runs out the door and hails a cab. He's got to get to the bank and cash this check as soon as possible. Because besides mortgages and alimony payments, Freed's got rapidly mounting legal bills thanks to that so-called riot in Boston. Riot. It was just kids dancing in the aisles to Chuck Berry. If the police hadn't stopped the show, everything would have been fine. The trial keeps getting postponed, and with every delay, it feels like Freed's lawyer is just soaking him for more money. Despite his success and fame, Freed feels under siege. He's feeling the full weight of the rock and roll backlash. He's heard stories that some DJs aren't just refusing to play rock records, they're smashing them on the air. Who does that? Freed genuinely can't understand why anyone would feel threatened by rock and roll. It's such joyous, exuberant music. It makes people want to dance. It's breaking down racial barriers. Calling it the devil's music, that's just racist code for black music. These people who hate rock and roll, they're anti-black, anti-teen, anti-fun. What's wrong with them? Even people who aren't openly against rock and roll are trying to sanitize it. Like that Dick Clark guy. Sure, he has black artists on American Bandstand, but good luck finding a single black kid in that Lily White studio audience of his. After dropping by the bank to cash Sam Weiss's check, Freed heads to WNEW Studios, where every afternoon at 5 p.m. he hosts a local TV dance show called Alan Freed's Big Beat Party. Then, because he needs the money, he has to rush over to his second job as DJ at WABC, the New York radio affiliate of ABC, the same network that employs Dick Clark. At WABC staff meetings, Freed has to sit and listen to everyone talk about how great American Bandstand is doing. It is now ABC's top-rated show, with over 8 million viewers each day, and it's infuriating. It's nearing showtime. Freed puts on his plaid jacket, adjusts his bow tie, and steps out of his dressing room to head for the stage. WNEW TV puts on Big Beat Party at an old Broadway theater. The backstage areas are cramped and dark with long, narrow hallways that today, for Freed, feel longer than usual. But when he steps out onto the stage and hears 600 teenagers squeal at his appearance, his old showman's instincts kick in. And now, America's number one vocal group, with two great record hits, here are the Platters. Behind the scenes, Alan Freed is a mess. But hand him a microphone, and he's still the king of rock and rollers, still adored by his teenage fans. Dick Clark may be getting all the glory these days, but as far as Freed is concerned, Clark is just a Johnny-come-lately, a flash in the pan, getting by on his looks. He doesn't understand or care about the music the way Freed does. People like Dick Clark have no idea that rock and roll is here to stay, and so is Alan Freed. In October 1958, at the Philadelphia WFIL-TV studios, Dick Clark arrives at the office that he shares with his American bandstand producer, Tony Mamarella. It's a cramped, windowless room, cluttered with stacks of 45 records and piles of fan mail. You'd never guess that this was the nerve center of a show that earns its host network, ABC, over $12 million a year, the equivalent of $100 million today. But this is the way Clark likes it. He's not flashy with his personal wealth, and he tries to keep his workspace modest. He hunts through a pile of recently arrived 45s until he finds the new one from Dwayne Eddy, the 20-year-old guitar signed to Jamie Records and SRO Artists. SRO is Clark's label and Clark's management company. Eddy is scheduled to appear on Bandstand again in a few weeks, and Clark is eager to hear the kid's latest. But Clark's not impressed. The song is way too slow. The kids will never dance to it, and if the kids don't dance, he has no show. He lifts the needle off the record and makes a call to his business partner. When his partner picks up, Dick starts right in. He demands that Dwayne get back in the studio fast and cut something new, something up-tempo, another rebel rouser. Dick gives them a week. He hangs up and wonders, do I have to do everything myself? Technically, he can do everything himself. He owns not just record labels, but song publishers, a management company, and a record pressing plant. It's now possible for an artist to put out a record and have every step in the process, from recording to manufacturing to distribution to an appearance on Bandstand, all controlled by Dick Clark. To keep his empire running smoothly, Clark is now working 18-hour days. But he doesn't mind. He's making a killing. And unlike his biggest rival in rock and roll broadcasting, Alan Freed, he's doing it legitimately. Everyone in the business knows that Freed is up to his neck in payola, accepting cash and gifts from every label in town in exchange for playing their records. One record label boss even paid for Freed's swimming pool, but Dick Clark has never taken a dime of payola. A percentage of a new song's publishing rights? Sure. But that's all legal and above board. 
He worked hard to get where he is, and his hands and conscience are clean. At lunchtime, Clark heads down the block to an Irish bar called the Brown Jug. He eats here most days, in a back room where he holds court with various record promoters. While most of his lunchmates drink beer and Irish whiskey, Clark sips a ginger ale. It's a sparsely decorated private dining room with faded green walls, a single round table, and mismatched chairs. No one would ever guess that it's where some of the biggest deals in the record business get made. Today, Clark's company at the Brown Jug includes Harry Finfer, a veteran record promoter and one of Clark's partners in his label, Jamie Records. He's one of the business's old-school hustlers with slick back hair and a pencil-thin mustache that twitches when he gets excited. It was Finfer who introduced Clark to Dwayne Eddy. He also does promotion for several other labels, and right now, his top priority is a single called 16 Candles. Clark's heard the record, but thinks it's a stiff. Finfer is insistent. The label behind 16 Candles will do anything, anything to make it a hit. What happens in the back room at the Brown Jug stays at the Brown Jug. But a few weeks later, the owner of the copyright on 16 Candles transfers 100% of the publishing rights to January Music, yet another company owned by Dick Clark, through which he obtains the copyright to songs and collects on their royalties. And right after that, Clark starts playing 16 Candles on American Bandstand, and playing it, and playing it some more. Over the last two months of the year, Clark plays 16 Candles on his show more than 30 times, and lo and behold, the song becomes a smash hit. It sells so many copies that its first pressing sells out, so Dick Clark's pressing plant rushes some more copies into stores. Clark would never deny his vested interest in the success of 16 Candles, but he doesn't go around announcing it either. No one watching American Bandstand would ever know he has a financial stake in the song, not to mention dozens of other tunes in heavy bandstand rotation. It's all perfectly legal, but Clark is savvy enough to know that his show's viewers need to see him as a nice guy, a trusted friend, and a fan of music, not a cagey businessman who's building a rock and roll empire on the backs of Bandstand's guest performers, people like the Crests, the doo-wop group behind 16 Candles. Clark is right to be cautious. He doesn't know it, but the same anti-rock and roll backlash that's threatening Alan Freed's career is about to catch up to him, too. And when it does, his nice guy image won't be enough to save him. On October 29, 1959, in his cramped, cluttered office in Midtown Manhattan, a 45-year-old songwriter named Burton Lane sits down at his roll-top desk to write a letter. He hopes what he's about to write will change his industry for the better, and he's in a position of power that might get him his wish. Lane is the president of the American Guild of Authors and Composers, a trade group that protects the rights of his fellow songwriters. And right now, Lane wants to protect them from the scourge of rock and roll payola. In the 1951 film Royal Wedding, Fred Astaire danced on the ceiling to a Burton Lane tune. But since then, he hasn't had a hit. Even in Hollywood, once his bread and butter, he can barely find work. These days, nearly every so-called movie musical just features a bunch of kids dancing on the beach to rock music. When Lane learned the truth that rock and roll was being driven by payola, he was livid. And Lane isn't alone. Every day he hears complaints from his fellow guild members about lack of work and shrinking royalty checks. The American Guild of Authors and Composers mostly represents old-school songwriters. The so-called composers of this new rock music have their own rights organization, Broadcast Music Incorporated, or BMI. It was formed by the radio industry, further proof as far as Lane is concerned that radio and rock musicians are conspiring to keep real songwriters, like him, off the air. Since becoming Guild president two years ago, Lane has been collecting articles from trade magazines like Billboard and Variety that describe various payola practices. He's forwarded them to the FCC, begging them to investigate. So far, no response. But recently, he discovered Congress has a special committee that just concluded a sweeping investigation of TV quiz shows, which they discovered were rigged. Lane wants the committee to do for radio what it did for television. Lane writes his letter out longhand, in flowing script. His penmanship is impeccable from years of writing out lyrics and musical notations. There is no doubt that commercial bribery has become a prime factor in determining what music is played on many broadcast programs and what musical records the public is surreptitiously induced to buy. Lane slips his letter into a large brown envelope, along with clippings of some of the articles about payola he's collected, a small portion of the entire sordid story as he describes them in his letter. He addresses the letter to the Congressional Committee's general counsel, a man named Robert Lishman. Then he puts on his coat and steps out into the crisp autumn air to walk to the nearest post office to send his letter via registered mail. On his way, he passes a row of unassuming brownstones that bear the names of long-gone businesses like Whitney Warner Music and Leo Feist Music Publishing. This is Tin Pan Alley, where Lane got his start more than 20 years ago writing out sheet music for his mentor, George Gershwin. A decade ago, this street was the songwriter's capital of the world. From every brownstone, a cacophony of pianos rang out as dozens of composers tried to write the next hit for Bing Crosby, Judy Garland, or Frank Sinatra. Now it's virtually silent. Burton Lane knows that his letter to Congress can't bring back Tin Pan Alley. Most of these brownstones have long since been rented out to other businesses. But he hopes it can bring back real music. Maybe, by ridding his industry of payola, he can rid it of rock and roll, too. In the small town of Fox Lake, Illinois, Joe Glinowitz was a hometown hero and 30-year veteran of the local police department. On September 1, 2015, just one month from retirement, he was found dead outside an abandoned cement plant, shot in the chest twice at close range. While the town and Joe's family mourned his passing, hundreds of police officers launched a manhunt to find his killer. 
After weeks of searching, the lead investigator discovered chilling secrets about Joe, the local police department, and the village of Fox Lake. These were secrets that once uncovered would put the town in the national spotlight and haunt them for years to come. Wondery's shocking true crime podcast, Over My Dead Body, is back for a third season with a story about corruption, betrayal, and the secrets of a fallen hero. Follow Over My Dead Body Season 3, Fox Lake, on Apple Podcasts, or you can listen early and ad-free by subscribing to Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts or the Wondery app. Hey, I'm Mike Corey, the host of Wondery's Against the Odds. In our next season, I'm telling the story of a group of Chilean miners who are trapped half a mile underground when their mine collapses. At first, rescuers fear that the men were crushed to death under tons of rubble. Then, when they make contact with the miners, they must undertake a rescue operation unlike any other in mining history, one that will be watched by over one billion people around the world. This is the incredible story of how mine experts, rescue specialists, politicians, and even NASA teamed up to reunite 33 men with their families on the surface. Follow Against the Odds on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or wherever you're listening right now. On November 3rd, 1959, in Washington, D.C., attorney Robert Lishman walks briskly down a long hallway carrying a briefcase and puffing a pipe. He's on his way to see his boss, Arkansas Congressman Orrin Harris. And he's pretty sure that what he's got in his briefcase is going to make Congressman Harris very happy. Orrin Harris is the chair of the House Special Subcommittee on Legislative Oversight, and Bob Lishman is the subcommittee's general counsel. When Lishman's friends outside government ask him to translate all that, he just usually tells them, I catch bad guys in television and radio. And recently, Lishman nabbed some of his biggest bad guys yet. The subcommittee is wrapping up hearings on the rigging of TV game shows, or quiz shows, as they're usually called. In the Senate hearing room, the dramatic climax of the probe of fixed and rigged quiz shows. Charles Van Doren's wife and father, poet Mark Van Doren, are in the audience. And now, Lishman's got a case that could be even more dramatic than the quiz shows. He can't wait to see Congressman Harris's face when he tells him. Bob Lishman and Orrin Harris make an unlikely team. Lishman is a Harvard-educated New Englander, and Harris is a scrappy Southern farmer's son. But the men share a fierce moral code and a love of legal theatrics. No witness stands a chance when the two of them takes turns grilling them. In Harris's office, Lishman opens his briefcase and takes out a letter from Burton Lane, president of the American Guild of Authors and Composers. He hands it to Harris, summing up the contents. According to Lane, a widespread practice of commercial bribery called payola has corrupted hundreds, possibly thousands of radio DJs who are all accepting cash and gifts in exchange for playing certain records on the air. And the worst offenders, says Lane, are the rock and roll DJs. It's this last part that interests Harris. Like most Southern politicians of his era, he's a staunch segregationist, and to his ears, rock and roll means black music. He's troubled by how white teenagers seem to be eating it up. He always wondered how such trash made it onto the radio, and maybe this is the explanation. Harris tells Lishman to look into it. Lishman nods, smirks, and takes a long, satisfied drag on his pipe. On November 16th, Alan Freed is sitting alone in his apartment, drinking. It's been less than two weeks since Congress announced its investigation into payola, and the entire industry is in a panic. Alan knows several DJs who have already been fired. Now his payola sources have disappeared. Sam and Highwise stopped returning his calls. Even his old friend Morris Levy has dropped off the face of the earth. He finishes his scotch and looks balefully at the envelope on his dining room table. It's an affidavit his employers at WABC sent to all DJs and broadcasters on staff, a legal declaration drawn up by their fancy lawyers that everyone's supposed to sign, pledging that they've never taken payola. Alan had his own lawyer take a look to translate. It turns out that their definition of payola is so broad, you couldn't even let a record promoter buy you a cup of coffee without being considered in breach and taking a bribe. Of course, he's not going to sign it. It'll blow over. They're just doing it to cover their asses. Freed startled. That phone hasn't rung in weeks. Maybe it's Levy or one of the Weiss brothers. Where's your affidavit, Alan? It's his WABC station manager, Ben Hoberman. He's the last person Freed wants to talk to. Hoberman is a busybody with a broomstick up his ass. You didn't get it yet? Must have got lost in the mail. Come on, Alan. Everyone's signing it. It's just a formality. Just drop it by my office when you come in to do your show tonight. I, I can't do it, Ben, and you know it. The way the thing is worded, I'd be perjuring myself. Well, that's a little melodramatic, don't you think? No, it's true. This part here about financial interest directly affected by the broadcast of music... WABC knew when they hired me that I'm not just a DJ. I'm a concert promoter, a songwriter. I just can't lie and pretend none of that exists. No one's asking you to lie, Alan. If you want to disclose that stuff, go right ahead. So you can fire me? No thanks. They go around in circles for almost an hour. Finally, in exasperation, Alan comes out with a question he actually wants answered. Just tell me one thing. Has Dick Clark signed it? Show me Clark's signature and I'll sign it too. I have no idea whether Dick signed it. That's not our department. Cut the crap, Overman. You can find out. When Clark signs, I sign. Freed hangs up, pours himself another scotch, and says a silent prayer that the end to this madness is soon. That afternoon, back in Philadelphia, Dick Clark arrives at WFIL-TV studios for his taping of American Bandstand. But for the first time, he feels unsettled. His longtime producer, Tony Mamarella, quit the show rather than sign ABC's affidavit. Clark knew Tony was into some payola, but was careful not to ask about the details. He figures if Tony quit, he must have been in pretty deep. Clark refused to sign the affidavit, too. 
But the decision wasn't hard. Unlike the papers they sent to Alan Freed and Tony, ABC gave their star TV host a way out. They agreed to let Clark's lawyer draw up his own version of the affidavit, one that included a much more narrow definition of payola. And this version, Clark could sign in good conscience. His lawyer filed it just this morning, so he's off the hook, at least for anything that might get him in trouble with the law. But he still got troubles. As part of the ABC deal, Clark had to agree to divest himself of all his music-related businesses, and he was doing it fast. With rock and roll in the crosshairs of the press, the media is having a field day with all the bandstand Golden Boy's alleged conflicts of interest. His lawyer and business partners have already started the process. By the time he's done taping today's bandstand, Dick Clark is going to be a lot less rich. Dick Clark may still have a job, but six days later, Alan Freed does not. That Saturday, he learns that WABC has fired him for refusing to sign the affidavit. On Monday, November 23rd, Alan Freed is called into the corporate offices of his other employer, WNEW-TV, his only employer now. It's been two days since WABC fired him, and he assumes the station wants to discuss the situation, but he brings his lawyer along just in case. To his shock, he's fired, on the spot. The station's general manager, Bennett Korn, puts a hand on Freed's slumped shoulder. We wanted to do it nicely, you know, face to face. Now, let's go downstairs, and we've got a press conference schedule. In the lobby of the building, Freed stands blinking at the camera flashes as Korn explains that Freed and WNEW are parting ways by mutual consent. Freed can't believe what he's hearing. He wants to tell them he had no intention of ever leaving rock and roll, but he's too stunned to speak. Mr. Korn, does this have anything to do with congressional payola investigation? No, not at all. At no time have we suspected Mr. Freed of any wrongdoing. Then why is he getting canned? It's a contractual dispute, an internal matter. Alan, Alan, any comment? Freed steps up to the cluster of news microphones. He looks dazed. I, I don't think of it as them firing me. We, we discussed this several weeks ago. Freed's lawyer leads his client to a waiting town car through a scrum of shouting reporters and flashing cameras. Freed ducks into the back seat and slams the door. That afternoon, back at his apartment, Freed is drinking heavily. He feels alone and trapped. The more he thinks about that press conference at WNEW, the angrier he gets. Why didn't anyone give him a chance to tell his side of the story? And why is he being targeted? It doesn't seem fair. So when a New York Post reporter shows up on his doorstep, Freed can't let him in fast enough. Over more whiskey, Freed's side of the story comes spilling out. Drunkenly, Freed declares that he knows plenty of bigwigs in broadcasting who are on the take, and if he goes down, he'll start naming names. He says what he's done is no better or worse than what anyone else in the business is doing. He says he's never accepted or requested a cash bribe, but like every other DJ, he's not above the occasional gift. The reporter presses him for an example. If someone sent Freed a Cadillac, would he send it back? Freed replies, no, it would depend on the color. Freed says he's being unfairly scapegoated. If he's being investigated, he says, then Dick Clark should be investigated too. Later that night, through the haze of alcohol, Freed hears his phone ringing. It's his old friend Morris Levy. About time, Freed thinks. Levy tells him he saw the evening edition of The Post. The entire city is talking about his interview. Freed can hear the real concern in his old friend's gravelly voice as he asks him, Alan, what the hell were you thinking? The next day, a Tuesday, Freed gets a call from his lawyer with more bad news. IRS agents came to WABC and WNEU and seized Alan's final paychecks. Apparently, he's under investigation for tax evasion now, too. Friday morning, he served with a subpoena demanding his financial records. But by now, he's past caring. All he cares about is his show on WNEW-TV that night. He's been told it will be his last. On Friday, November 27th, 1959, at 5 p.m., Alan Freed walks onto the stage of his WNEW Big Beat Party for the last time. It's an emotional moment. When he squints past the glare of the stage lights, he's startled to see some of the kids crying. A group of record distributors presents Alan with a scroll of appreciation. Sam and High Weiss are among them, hovering quietly in the background. Morris Levy is a no-show. As he's signing off, Alan can't resist one last parting shot, saying direct to camera, Paola may stink, but it's here, and I didn't start it. On his way out of the studio, he's cornered by two men in trench coats, more federal agents serving him with yet another subpoena. They're startled by Alan's reaction when he tells them, I'll just add it to the pile, boys. With that, Alan Freed's reign as the king of rock and rollers is over. But his troubles and the Paola investigation are just getting started. On Tuesday, December 1st, 1959, Congressional General Counsel Robert Lishman arrives at the New York District Attorney's Office in Lower Manhattan. He's there to meet with an assistant DA named Joseph Stone, who's opened his own payola investigation. Stone is a pugnacious prosecutor with a lifelong New Yorker's tough, no-nonsense demeanor. Lishman also worked with him on the quiz show investigations, and he admires his tenacity. Stone has already convened a grand jury and started subpoenaing witnesses, as well as the financial records of over 50 record companies. The New York DA's office has an advantage over the feds. New York State has some of the nation's broadest laws regarding commercial bribery, and in New York, payola falls well within the definition of what it means to take a bribe. At the federal level, the law is a little less clear. It's unlikely Lishman will be able to indict anyone, but Stone's office can. In fact, Stone has already set his sights on one of the payola investigation's biggest targets, Alan Freed. 
It will take cooperation between state and federal law enforcement, sharing of witness testimony and subpoena documents, choosing who to prosecute and who should be granted immunity. But Bob Lishman thinks that with Stone's help, he can not only expose Paola, he can put some people behind bars. On February 5, 1960, Morris Levy arrives at a New York courthouse to testify before Joseph Stone's grand jury. The grand jury is just a fact-finding body. No one called before it is accused of anything. Yet. But Levy hates courtrooms, and he arrives spoiling for a fight, ready to defend himself and the people he works with. As far as Levy's concerned, the DA's investigation so far is pure harassment. They sent agents to Roulette Records headquarters to seize their books. They subpoenaed all of Levy's employees, even some of his artists. But Levy is resolute. If they're trying to intimidate him, or hoping he'll slip up and somehow incriminate himself, it will not work. In front of the grand jury, Joseph Stone hammers Levy, questioning him about various payments and loans Roulette Records made over the years to various DJs, but especially Alan Freed. One payment in particular for $10,000 stands out. It was listed on Roulette's books as a promotion fee, then a loan, then changed back to a promotion fee. Levy tries to wave it off as a personal matter. Alan and I had an argument in February, so I said to my comptroller, screw him, I'm going to make him pay it. Then about four months later, I got over it and said, ah, take it off. But Stone is relentless. He doesn't care whether the $10,000 was a loan or a gift. He wants to know what Levy got in return. Finally, under Stone's heavy questioning, Levy lets it slip that yes, he and Freed had a tacit understanding. In return for the ten grand and various other payments, Freed would favor releases by roulette records. Levy realizes he slipped up. When Stone tries to dismiss him, he refuses to leave the witness stand. He turns boastful, trying to save face. Al and I make $250,000 a year on rock and roll shows. If I give him ten grand or even twenty grand, what's the big deal? That's peanuts to us. It's nothing. But Stone has gotten what he needs. Thank you, Mr. Levy. You can leave now. The night after Morris Levy tells the grand jury a little too much, Alan Freed walks through the stage door entrance of the historic Apollo Theater in Harlem. He's haggard, his face puffy from drinking. The scars from his car accident many years ago stand out against his blotchy skin. You'd never guess, looking at him, that he's only 38 years old. Freed doesn't want to be here. He doesn't want to be anywhere except home alone with a bottle. But he's got a show to do. Freed has many fond memories of the Apollo. It was the scene of one of his greatest concerts, a 1955 Halloween party featuring his star act, The Moon Glows. Now it's the scene of his last stand. He's broke and still out of work. No one in radio will give him the time of day. If this show isn't a hit, he's done for. Backstage, Freed goes through the motions, greeting the performers, telling them what a great show it's going to be. But when he walks into the wings and peers out at the audience, he can see that half the seats are empty. He tells himself it's still early, that the place will fill up, but he can't quite convince himself it's true. Morris Levy is a no-show, as are most of Freed's old friends from the industry. But at least one friend has come to show his support, Al Jackson. Jackson is still the city's most popular black DJ and is especially beloved here in Harlem. It was Jackson who called in a few favors to help Freed book this show. The two old friends greet each other warmly. Jackson asks how Alan's holding up. Freed gives a meager smile and says, I'm fine, Hal, you know me. I never let the bastards get me down. Freed is proud to have the support of people like Hal Jackson. And even if the seats aren't filled, he's proud to look out at the Apollo audience and see black and white kids all sitting mixed together, side by side, ready to cheer on the same acts, regardless of race. That's his legacy, Freed thinks. Not this payola crap. That's what they'll remember him for. As he hears the drum roll signaling his entrance, Freed adjusts his bow tie and plasters a crooked smile across his face, takes a deep breath, bounds out onto the stage, into the glare and the spotlight. But as Freed introduces the first act, he can feel something unfamiliar, dripping down the back of his shirt collar, flop sweat. He can already feel it in his bones. This show is going to be a bust. Hours later, after the crowd is gone, the acts have been paid, and the Apollo's owner has taken his hefty cut. Alan Freed steps out onto the Harlem sidewalk to have a cigarette before calling it a night. His damp collar feels clammy against his neck in the cold night air. In his pockets are his night's earnings. A couple hundred bucks. He could have been worse, he tells himself. At least the show didn't lose money. He looks up at the Apollo's famous marquee, now dark, and he tries to convince himself he'll be back. But he won't be. This is the last concert he'll ever host in New York. Right now, Alan Freed has only got one thing going for him. He told that New York Post reporter that if he went down, he would take a lot of people with him. And he's about to make good on that promise. Next on American Scandal. As the congressional payola hearings make national headlines, Alan Freed and Dick Clark are called to testify. And in New York, Hal Jackson finds himself at the center of the district attorney's campaign to put payola takers behind bars. I hope you enjoyed this episode of American Skin. If you did, subscribe now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Wondery.com, or wherever you're listening to this right now. If you're listening on a smartphone, tap or swipe over the cover art of this podcast. You'll find the episode notes, including some details you may have missed. You'll also find some offers from our sponsors. By supporting our sponsors, you help us offer this show to you for free. We'd also like to learn a little bit about you. Please complete a short survey at Wondery.com slash survey. That's Wondery.com slash survey. We'd love to learn what you're listening to, what you like, and what topics we might tackle next. You can also find us and me on Twitter. Search for hashtag American Scandal or follow me at Lindsay A. Graham. We use many sources when researching our stories, but we highly recommend the book Big Beat Heat, Alan Freed and the Early Years of Rock and Roll by John A. Jackson. 
And just a quick note about our reenactments. In most cases, we can't know what exactly was said, but everything in our show is based on historical research. American Scandal is hosted, edited, and executive produced by me, Lindsey Graham, for Airship. Sound designed by Derek Barrett. This episode is written by Andy Herman, editing by Casey Miner. Executive producers are Stephanie Jens, Jenny Lauer-Beckman, and Hernan Lopez for Wondery.